É, mas em princípio é o mesmo. Inglês, mas se você quiser, em estatística, daí fez no meio da astronomia, e aí ela depois foi fazer doutorado na astronomia, e agora ela está de volta aqui no IEF. Então, como quiser, ela, ela contou praticamente todo o bairro na tela. São Paulo tem seu nome lá. O local, né? Quem sabe? Já falou, né? Cara? E ela vai falar, então, sobre busca de quadrais com uh, dados, com tipo, né? das bandas e dos grupos de ó. Also, just to add to that, I also did my undergrad research in computer science. So you don't have to do the same thing. I have a very nice background. So this is more of a quite interdisciplinary. Um, and I'm going to present basically what I've been on my, what I've done on my PhD. Uh, so, the last meeting, Leah was here talking a little bit about S plus. She did some search of closed circuit software analysis with S plus. And I don't know if you all remember, but for her. I was not one, here, so. I'm ashamed to reduce my work. She used um, some of my results. She used me to work. Uh, well, well, quasars, so I'm, I'm more interested in quasars, and quasars are time with AGMs, so they um, they show this, uh, they're characterized by this broad emission lines in their spectrum, and uh, they have very high luminous, uh, luminous objects, and due to that, we observe them at very large distance, and I think this is still for the quasars to be observed uh, at redshift 7.64. Um, and so, well, for S plus, S plus is a, stands for South and Photometric Local Universe Survey. So in the local universe survey, we would get such a quasars and survey. Mm -hmm. um, Not so local. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so S plus, if you're not aware, uh, S plus is it's being led, and uh, most of the people before and the core of S plus who are running the survey are in Brazil, are Brazilian. Um, so quite Brazilian project. We have this telescope in CTIO in Chile. It's this dome. Uh, uh, it's a small telescope. It's only 80 centimeters in diameter, but the the advantage, the power of S plus is that yeah, we it's equipped with two field wheels. Um, each field wheel has six filters. And we have a total of 12 filters. Um, so those are the photometric bands that we have. So in addition with the broad bands, we have U, G, R, and C. Um, in addition to that, we have seven elements that centered in seven spectral features, such as the child, for instance, right? Uh, so what the data looks like, so we've seen uh, some confirmed sources, spectroscopical confirmed sources, so on top from phaser, fraction three, um, galaxy star, and a one. And what you see on top of uh, the spectrum are the S plus pluses. So um, as squares, you see the broad band fluxes, and the circles, you see narrow band fluxes. And you can see that, for instance, for that phase over there, we are capturing one or two line in, in an event. The idea of that is that um, with more information, more photometric information, we can have better estimations uh, for both classification and photometric redshift. Uh, and with photometric survey, we can, well, that information, um, have measurements for lots more um, objects than doing spectroscopic survey, right? Um, so this is a, a, a field of S plus, so it's more or less two square degrees, um, and our plate scale is 0.55 arcseconds per pixel. Um, you see that we can like can constrain an inner structure of the galaxy, for instance. Um, this is one field in the Hydra um, region. Can you say a few words about the camera because I don't know. 
Yeah, if I remember well, uh, the images that we have they have like 11,000 11, pixels. Only one CCD. I think so. Yeah, but it's one of those very large format ones. Thank you. Wait, thank you. Um, we started observations in actually in 2017, but the first data release was in um, 2019, uh, where we released the, this striped to area in blue. And I feel like seeing here are the footprint to put in your best was. Uh, when they survey is complete. In 2021, we released the year two, the year three in 2022, the in last year, and the year five is going to be publicly released next year, but it is already available for members of the collaboration. So this is the data. So each region is visited by the 12 yes. filters. Yes. The yes. same amount of time. Yes. Okay. The, the exporter time is different between filters, but yeah, yeah this, these settings are always the same. And we also have, this is from the main survey, but we have other surveys as well, where we do less exporter time, mm -hmm. call for this short survey to catch the broad stars, for instance. But for main survey, um, yeah, they always keep the same settings. What is the depth? The depth, um, it depends on the filter. Yes. But, um, our band is like 21 or 20. Um, one of the narrow bands is on 21 as well, but the other side. And for reading catalog of candidates of voices, with candidates, um, for us it's a bit challenging just the fact that most of the concurrent voices are in the north. But this is just because of a lack of the dedicated surveys, spectroscopic surveys in the south. Uh, so most of our overlap with um with spectroscopic surveys is in this region, we can try to contribute to And also the other layer in this game. Um it's the combination of having a large, very large area that was already observed, already released, uh, together with the narrow band feature system with seven narrow bands, there is now the uh, survey in the south. Uh, where the described this, and of course, we have to take other things on the north, but this is the south, um, that's what we find in it. Um, and as a fact, um, with the narrow band information, we expect to have better communication and better photometric questions and make us well, able to do science with templates um, in photometric data. And that is use uh, machine learning, so just to briefly explain. Uh, so we have a set of features uh, that we call the input variables that can be divided through this process um, or something. Uh, do we want to relate that to our um, output variable that we are interested in, which is either classification or the matching? I like this paper from Greenman in um, 2001, where he explained two paradigms of, paradigms of uh, statistical modeling, uh, where the first, uh, you are interested in how X correlates with your output. And you want to see some law of nature there. And we have another another um, aspect of it where we do not we are not interested in how those variables relate to your to our output, but you want to have a good prediction. So we are only interested in good predictions in this case. We are not interested in the information that are behind. We want to have very good predictions on the new data. And most of my work here are patients uh, with access of supervised learning. Uh, so we use uh, confirmed sources and we use a truth table, um, the objects that were observed as spectroscopically, um, here by Sloan. So I mostly used uh, data from Sloan. 
as my children said. Uh, my wallet divided in two. Um, the first one is the classification of stars according to the galaxies. Um, um, magnitudes from S plus and also magnitudes in infrared from lines and other morphological features that get from images. And the second part of my work, we did the photometric redshift estimation with colors, and we are also adding the ultraviolet colors. Um, I guess I want to check algorithms. Those are just the algorithms that are in the paper, the corresponding papers, but in practice, we decided a lot more than that. Um, but just to give an idea of the algorithms that we use in the training and the training phase uh, of this works and what I have been preparing um, in, in the papers. So we have the models. Um, as I said, uh, the, the, our goal is to have the better predictions that we can have. So all the metrics are based on the quality of the of this of these predictions. And <coughs> so just to here all, all the metrics that I use for each case, but I'm not going to go into details here. Um, and well, here for the classification, we start with the classification. So uh, what you see here is a projection of all the features that I use uh, for training the models. So those are the 12 S plus magnitudes, four morphological features from the images, and the two parallel magnitudes. And this is a projection of those um, all of these features in two dimensions using TIST SME. Um, where what I want to see here is this separability, if that's the world, uh, but how well uh, the classes are separated um, in this in this in this region. So everything you see here, I confirm it with galaxy squares and stars. Um, one thing that is interesting to see is that um, we can still distinguish the three classes, even um, for the sources that are these small islands are combinations of missing values. So even when we have missing values, we are still be having um, the possibility of separating these objects. So this is just to give us insight. Yeah. But this is a multi-dimensional space, so it could be that these regions are really well separated. In some yeah. variables. Yeah, it, this is just for the sake of visualization. Okay. So we can't conclude anything from here, just that we have insights that, okay, this is possible to do. Um, but what I want to show is the same projection, it's doing the same type of projection, but without the infrared magnitudes. Because, um, Infrared information, uh, the, the Y survey is shallower than S. So we have a regime um, at 20 magnitudes that we won't have Y information. And what I want to see here is that we can still have good <coughs> classification even when we don't have Y. So it's a bit worse. You'll see here. It's a bit worse, but it's too good. And the other sorry, sorry, just out of curiosity, what are the morphological variables that you use? I use from radius A, B, uh, and we have max. Those are the morphologies that I use. So everything that I said, I did the analysis looking at the metrics. Um, so for instance, some experiments that I run is, well, I use random forest for this. Um, but what happens when I train the random forest with all the magnitudes from S plus? Then second, what happens when I add two voice magnitudes? I think this last two is what if I train only with five broadbands and then I compare. And from, from this result, I conclude that, well, as expected, including wise magnitudes and infrared information improves a lot the classification. 
but it's, it, that, that is already you know. Um, we already knew that from the literature. Um, but what's for me more interesting to see is that when we don't have wise counterparts, this is why the narrow band information uh, is only a more important goal. So, so the final models were um, so used all the information for the final models. Uh, we were we are running this um, classified since as plus dr two. Um, for dr three, I also did the classification for s plus. Um, for s plus dr four, which is the uh, latest public data release. Um, I had to change a little bit the models, um, so the performance um, analysis uh, for this model is written in this documentation here. But the idea is to use this data as I give a probability, probability of a source being a quasar, being a star, being a galaxy, and depending on the threshold of the probability that you choose, you will have a standard relationship with uh, how much you recover, how much you are going to get a right classification. So um, I give this kind of information so any user can choose your own threshold at the sake of some sort of uh, losing uh, objects or having a contamination. For the F5, it's internal data at this moment. I train it about the model, now adding information from Gaia. Um, in practice, when we're using the data, um, I had some complaints, like people were complaining that we had lots of contamination of stars, um, you know, galaxy um, selection. And so I tried to improve the model by adding the information, and it seems that we got rid of this contamination that we had special gap below Z between galaxies in, and by releasing these plots, but um, you see here is the cumulative contamination rates for each class, and then how much you're missing for each class in, in the second row, and the dashed curves are the models that now includes that. So uh, uh, having a good improvement, um, but as a gas to the depth of S plus, uh, with this last two points, the curves um, are already beyond limit where we don't start. So Gaia has um, proper motions, parallax set the first star. So this is not, so once the parallax is given a proper motion, there's no question it's a star. Yeah. So is this, so this is taken out of this, of this uh, of this classification or because when when the when there is a measurement like this, nothing else matters, only the Gaia data. Mm -hmm. So it's it, any other data is relevant. So are those objects included there as well? Because they, they will take a number of objects which are for the most part galaxies and stars because they are the most most frequent one. You'll take away the stars which you know are stars and that will make it more um uh, it will improve the purity of the galaxy. So is this, are the objects, are the guidance confirmed stars taken out of this or? I think so, that's yeah. my intuition, yeah. That Gaia is helping to separate stars from the other two, from from places and, and galaxies. And it, it, no, no, but what my, my question is, uh, there's a number of objects for which the Gaia parallax or for promotion determines that an object is a, is a star, then nothing else matters. No other S plus data matters. Those objects, I mean, they are, they will of course improve the performance in the sense that it's almost like you're taking them away. It's like you don't, you shouldn't even consider them in the catalog of sources, so to speak, because they have already been classified by Gaia. My question is, yeah. Okay, so you probably ask the question again. <laughs> Are the confirmed Gaia stars taken out from this training? No. Okay. I'm only using the, the information. Okay. I tried to do that. I think what the time of your question is yeah. adding <clears throat> classifying sources, but 
from Gaia in the train set? Is that is that a question? No, not really. The question is uh, is whether you take away from the uh, from the training or the validation of tests objects that have confirmed Gaia proper motions of biohazards because they are these are not oh okay. So my question is following that. Let me restate this. Um, you are you are using uh, as input S plus and Gaia. Yes. Yes. All right. But whenever Gaia has a confirmed parallax for promotion, the training is smooth because Gaia has already confirmed this. So everything else is like manageable information. So when you train that, it's almost like you are training with something which has a known outcome because of the Gaia confirmed uh, because of Gaia has okay. confirmed that, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, I'm not sure how to deal with this case, but um, it's just. I think there are two. I don't know if that's the the way of thinking, but I see two options yeah. there that are considering that Gaia has confirmed the sources don't classify, don't don't want classification. That's one option, right? The second option is uh, that I went through is add the Gaia information. Because with those line information, I, I I expect to have matching classification for both. So I, I expect to to get get it right as well as guidance. So it's easier than running lots of if analysis, where you have to cross match a bunch of objects and see if they already have classification in guidance. I don't know if that makes sense. So you can check if your classifier use I mean put a very high weight in the Gaia. Input. Yes, yes, yes. You can check. The yes. Input. Yes, that's something that I, I intend to do. I also intend to compare um my weight catalog with Gaia plays the catalog as well. So yeah, that, that's uh, something that is in advance. Question. So you mentioned that you had a lot of contamination, and that's why you wanted to include guy information. But what do you mean? Because even in the the very representative sample of the training set, you had a lot of contaminations because the score was very good. But what, why why were you having a lot of contamination? In what regimes? So in the regimes of of um, brighter magnitudes and low redshift analysis. So this is basically a one by one conversation that I had and people that are using the data and they were like uh, seeing that uh, with their selections. When they looked at the images, they said that they saw that were like some sources and that's what we're trying to get me. Because actually, uh, uh, even at the right magnitude, really, we actually don't have to have good classification as well because the detection is also not that good mm -hmm. for these very certain sources. But, Okay. And then I answer. Um, but yeah, this is um work in progress and I prepared a paper about this and you know, I do uh, all the analysis comparisons and such to do the paper. Um, and what about deep learning? We also tested that deep learning with the images. Um so what we saw when when we what we're comparing here is the random forest that I'm running, uh, I'm using the catalogs as input data. Here, what we try to do is use the images to see how how good we are performing compared to a random forest on, on, on a tabular data. And what we conclude is uh, these four objects with wise counterpart, which are bright and gene, uh, we still have better performance different first. So we are not gaining much using the images as well. Um, but at the front of the gene, when we do an ensemble of the two of them, both the convolution neural network of the images together with the random forest using the tabular data as input, we have a smaller gain of false compared to the one that we have right now. So um, using only the, the magnitudes and such, in the process, we have like 86.87% of F score, 
And when we do an ensemble of images and tabular data, we have 87.52. But running deep learning with images is very, uh, and has a much higher computational cost. So it doesn't just fight for the projections. We don't need that much. And the webmic specification, we constructed by the catalog of our S plus, which I named as QCAST. Um, and I need a logo for that, but I was thinking about that. Uh, yes. And here what we see is the photometric redshift distribution when I set a threshold in probability of 80%, 20%, and 5%. And we have around 600,000 candidates with at least 80% probability over an area of 3,000 of IGBs of S plus Um. So yeah, so what I need to talk about right now is how did we estimate this photometric redshift? So this is one of the methods that we used, which is Blackboard. Uh, what it does is um, it basically estimates the conditional density of the of the redshift uh, using a Fourier basis, uh, and the coefficient the coefficients are uh, determined with a random forest uh, progressor. Um, but what I'm showing here, I think it's um, just for the sake of visualization again, uh, are the examples of the output of the expert. <coughs> so here what you're seeing is the conditional density estimates for the case when we include the narrowband information in pink and when we don't include the narrowband information in green. At the starting angle here, in the on the bus are these spectroscopic redshift. Uh, different regimes of redshift and magnitude. Uh, so those are nine points that, that I selected randomly just to look at the condition as the estimates. Um, and what we can see from here, of course, again, this is just a visualization, but the conclusions that I'm saying. We conclude that from the metrics um, when we analyze the metrics over all the testing sample. Um, but for the sake of the presentation, I'll focus on the how we are seeing it. Uh, that is, we <coughs> we see that it seems that uh, with the narrow band information, we are more certain about um, um, about, about the decimate of the redshift. And there are cases where, for instance, this case and this case, where if we didn't have the urban information, we would get like a huge error in the estimate. Can you go back one slide? So, um, so we have, so I suppose has these uh, narrowband filters at around 4,000 names, right? So that means that we're specially fit to, to the Lyman Alpha line at redshift 2.2. So when I look at these probabilities there, I see that greater than point I see a spike there, which is probably a real thing because we're detecting objects through the Lyman alpha line, right? Which is detectable in your filters exactly at that redshift 2.1, 2.2, 2. 2 point something, right? But as you increase that, uh, as you as you push it up, you don't see that anymore, except in this BMDN method. Flex mm -hmm. code and RF doesn't, they don't seem to find that spike in redshift 2.2 or so, which mm -hmm. you shouldn't expect. So um, it's, right, it's, yeah. it's surprising. It's, it's, it's a very clear feature, and often it's what we find also in GPS is small, right? So, it's it's a real thing. We actually select better there, right? So is is the what is BMDN? I, I want to talk about it. Okay, okay. Right. yeah. It was so it's, it is the let's say it is the more weighty scheme, or is it when you stack the methods, this is what that comes out on top, or this is just that all of them are. By the way, when this red one is when I averaging the the of the yeah. So on the average. You don't see any more in the very high likelihood ones, right? You don't see the spike at redshift higher. 
It's, it's funny because it's funny, yeah. uh, for Flexcode, when I calculated the loss function, when I compared it, what, how do I choose which one's better? Mm -hmm. I look at the loss function, the function mm -hmm. density estimation, uh, loss function. And Flexcode has the best one compared to the engine. So it's tricky. I, I will show some results later as well that it's mixing mixing results that it's hard to conclude. Okay. Okay. I ask a question about this. Uh, so you have a, a multi-modal uh, density, probability densities. Is that, uh, and then I think the, uh, the vertical line is the uh, the true value, is that? No, the vertical uh, line would be the single point estimate based on the peak. Oh, oh, single point. But then you can, this, this, prop, this have a, uh, sorry, spectroscopic redshift yeah. information. So you can, you can plot also where, where the correct redshift. It's hard to see anything. Is this? Ah. Triangles. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now I can see. Yeah, so this one is matching very well with the fragments. This one is far away from the wind one. This one is also far away. This one, uh, this other peak is high. This, so yes, this, this, this is a little bit crazy. Yeah. Well, no, with narrow bands, there's only one catastrophic error there, right? That one in the middle. Yes, the one right in the middle. Every, everything else is all far. Yeah. That's small error. Okay. The middle has two. Yeah, but the yeah, peak that matters is the pink one. Yeah. So what matters for the uh, dashed vertical line is. Yeah. It has two peaks that they spring over, right? Somehow it chips the other peak, peak right? Well, maybe one is slightly yeah. higher than the other. Yeah, it's slightly higher. Yeah, slightly yeah, higher. <laughs> no, but it's showing some. Yeah. If there's an error, right, associated with this redshift test. Yes, awesome. Well, how about the error? Uh, it's multimodal. How, how do you estimate the error in the redshift destination? Yeah, I don't estimate errors. I don't know exactly how to estimate errors. The new standard is just to give PDF. Yeah. And the PDF. You can and potentially do whatever you want. The PDF. Look at that. How many moments for the PDF you need to <laughs> characterize it? Forget it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to show the BMDN right now. And the plot I'm going to show is going to be the same line for you, this. Um, but just to explain the method, so BMDN is a neural network, it's a Bayesian neural network, but the output is a picture of Gaussians. So we, we end up in the neural network with seven parameters of Gaussians. Uh, and this is that it's similar, this method is similar to the one that we are using for galaxies, done by, I think. Uh, but I'm using the regime of 0.002 to the 0.7 redshift, and here we're going further. So he doesn't train with quasars, he only trains with galaxies. And it makes sense, like, as he was having success um, using, this net, using this architecture for galaxies to, to test as well in similar architecture in quasars. Uh, so this is what I see here right now. So, um, as I said, compared to compared to the loss function of the EFTN with FlexCode, FlexCode had a better result. Um, but it's it's too hard to conclude anything. But, but yeah, we we can we will see is quite the same things. Yeah, it's performing well. And in this case, I mean, of course, you're choosing me randomly, but in this case, yeah. there's no catastrophic error. Why, um, let me skip this and show this. Yes. It has to do what we were discussing about. But, um, so in this table, I show the general metrics for the single point estimates. So root mean square error, normalized media, absolute deviation, um, bias, outlier fraction with a casting 14, I want my fraction for 30. Uh, and in bold, I put all the best ones, all of them. And I also, for each of them, 
I've shown the results in metrics. Without narrow bands included in the good and with narrow bands today. When you mean average, it's really the average, not a stacking. It's literally the average of the results, the output of the three of them. And then I'll put the metrics. So the big link should have a smaller number of outliers at 0.15, right? Yes. And the, and the smallest bias also, right? Yes, very small bias, by the way, which is surprising. Yeah. But at the same time, the normalized media absolute image that we tend to use, um, that's cool, that's one of them. And also together with Yeah, the, but Sigma in Mad is really, yeah. you know, like four. I don't know. I don't. I don't think say too much on Sigmoid Lab. What I mean, for, for for broad bands where things are really broad and don't have then it's okay. But for these narrow bands, I typically don't like to use this that is for comparing the two right. methods because what we want to compare is the whole information of the if you guess, right? So the loss function considers that considers the whole shape of the yes. Um, yeah, for the loss of the loss of the loss. My hope is to now that we want to use this data to the science, is to try to do with each of these methods and see how goes. So can you go back to the others? Yeah, this one there. So uh, the distribution. So let's say that you would have. Um, I don't know how to say this, but it's for real the fact that you can see more places at a round check relative to point two. It's a real thing. I don't know, maybe there's a way of selecting this or showing this, but the fact that the distribution of a certain uh, classifier matches better than the final distribution is in itself a metric. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about distributions, for instance, we do Wasserstein distance, which is the way we look at distribution, right? So that's another metric that in this case would be important. In this case, it would, it would be much better for BM for uh, BMTN compared to the other driver. Right? So that's yeah. that's one that's one thing because yeah. what you really want is to have something that resembles a distribution that you know has to be there instead of just throwing away stuff that mm -hmm. Uh, he might use for cosmetic analysis. Sorry, two technical questions. That's okay. Wasserstein is the third mover's distance. So have two, so have two uh, mountains of the same yeah. volume, but they're different. And then you measure how much energy would you, would you spend to move this mountain over to the other with the least effort. Whoa. So it's a distance of two distributions, right? That's the Mm -hmm. I had to, to talk about what she's saying. This is not, you know, there's another one that's lay black. What's it called? Lay, lay black. Well, like cool, 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 black, 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 also published a quiz and catalog this year, so we kind of published it all at the same time. They call it quiet. That's <laughs> yeah, but it's from quiet. I like mine better. <laughs> yeah, so what I, I try to do is like a very simple uh, plot just to put the two against the other very quickly just to see. Uh, I probably the, the, the guy is very nearby, right? That should be. Yeah, but still, it's S plus, right? Mm -hmm. They're both same depth, same depth, same depth. This one yeah. goes to the depth of what? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. yeah. deeper. What uh, <coughs> I found interesting is that we don't quite see these trains that uh, bypass. So it might be a possible thing. So it works. And we go working. You look much better than quiet. Congrats. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I want to. Um, what method do they use? It's hard to understand. I, I tried to understand, but yeah. It's like, complicated. <laughs> for that one, it's KNN. For the photosynthesis, right? Yeah. 
but it's a mixture of classification and these, right? And this is the final many things. And Gaia uses also variability, right? Because they have so, so many exposures, so they have better identification, right? So that's not a thing. That they, have. they have better separation because of the, the the same the same reason why you can measure the proper motions means that you can also measure variability. So quite so Gaia has a very good uh, confidence that things are always there, especially when they see variability. But not, but they don't see it for everything. Mm -hmm. But the ratio, it sucks. Yeah. For the classification as yes, for the ratio. Well, there is all well, there's a we were discussing before, but why has uh, around you know has a uh, order of two million objects? It's a, it's a lot more. It's a, it's, okay. it's yeah. many many more than that. So it's yes. okay. Yeah. It's a whole sky. Um. Just continue. Uh. One thing that I always try to do in my analysis is to try to measure the, the improvement due to the narrowband, the addition narrowband approach. And based on written square error for the disease, uh, we have a, an improvement in 11% compared to the model when we only trained with broadband photometry, which um, again, um, but um, when we add wise information, that drops to a factor of like 3%. So it's the same story that I was telling uh, in the classification part that the narrow band photometry is playing a more important role uh, at the point of the G where we don't have range information. Um, this I will skip because I showed here, yeah, but uh, I also analyzed the metric, the single point uh, estimate metrics. Where being of magnitude and very spectroscopic redshift and also the color. Um, but what I want to show is that um, for the low redshift regime and also very high redshift, we don't perform well as due to the lack of training sample at this at this uh, interval. <laughs> but we are yeah, and this metrics are calculated mostly everything that I'm showing here. Uh, but what we see, like, for instance, in between two and three, uh, we have like 2% effort. Uh, so. um, so, what we recently done, this was what we made this week, so it's fresh for the other. Pedro from Yeje, he's a postdoc, uh, he plotted my quasars from this catalog. Uh, all of this six uh, hundred uh, thousand places, he plotted uh, in this map um, and behind the, the points of my the black points are my data and I think that you colored are spectroscopic data from school with the boss so and when we were discussing about this map uh, we see some interesting trends like the data seems to match well like we don't see places where we don't see uh, galaxies or regions. I think this data has cast regions uh, from spectroscopic data. So where there are points, it seems that we also have it. It's just to see. Uh, what we're seeing here in the right is the galaxy photometric redshift that are really done by, by them. Um, right now, these are just the his testing set uh, that he's plotting, but it is to also Raise a similar map or the classified uh, analysis, the photometric classified analysis from my catalog. And also, they used to extend this map to higher redshifts because at this point, we are only plotting to what they did, the redshift. Um, what we've done as well is just, um, we've done some spectroscopic follow up with the Nine Telescope, the 8 meter telescope, Chile. And I I was awarded 20 hours of observations in January 2019. So at that moment, I didn't have a machine learning model yet at the, the point that it is right. So the selection was done, was done based on color color diagrams, for instance. So I'm not really um, concerned about the fact that we don't have many quasars here in the selection. 
for uh, the follow-up observations. Also, there are four objects that were released by Sloan afterwards, after the data of observations, uh, where two of them were actually places as well. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to explain that this column is a classification from my model right now. Genes classification is our visual classification looking at a spectrum uh, that we took. And when we compare this two, we see that it matches very well. There's one place that discovered <laughs> and there's one place that I'm, uh, there's one option to classify this place as the human model, but looking at the factor it seems to be a little bit of in general. It's not a, like a huge error because it's good. And this is the factor of the one scope and quizzes. Uh, from the spectrum observations. We think this line here is about even too wide, and based on that, we can't make a redshift, which is around 0.13, and those are our estimates for these the three methods that trained. So I was quite happy to see that. Okay, um, just to finish with some future perspectives. We were awarded more hours of observation, so we're doing more spectroscopic follow up. Um, we just got follow hours um, this semester, and the, we observed four quasars at higher redshift. Um, and they were already observed. We checked spectra. They are all quasars at redshift around three, which were within our selection. So we were also quite happy about that. But we just submitted another, another proposal for the next call which we submitted this week, by the way. Uh, I think well, the idea is to create a mini catalog, something like that, of spectroscopic um, observed quasars at high, high redshift in the software. Uh, one thing that I'm doing in parallel is um, working with CTF data for, for LSSG. So we are building a machine learning uh, workflow um, for um, selecting places in the program. Um, so we started to work with time series data as well. So yeah, so this was it was it and yeah, thank you. So, even more questions? Okay. Okay. I forgot to mention, but the idea now uh, is to use these places and galaxy catalogs um, for my postdoc. So, this is what I'm working with how to use that in large scale structure. The idea. So I have a very naive question. In your put put your plot, not the plot that your results where you give the results for your training, where you have the precision and the accuracy and whatever. This one? No, the table. This one. Um, yeah, maybe. What's the meaning of the Uncertainty, because precision and recall. What's the meaning of that? Because um, <laughs> we did this in a cable cross validation scheme, so we separate data into the cable folds, and we run the experiments multiple times. So this is just a variance the variance uh, of all these runs that we do. So it, it gives a very good precision, and then you run again and again and again, and then you, yeah. you, you, you do the, the... Yeah, I take the average, and then it's the dispersion of um, all the holes, all the, all the runs that I do. But the fact that the precision is usually higher when the uncertainty is smaller is correlated, or is there... Because if you... 
if you have a good precision, you have a good uh, method, and, and you think that you would have no or a smaller uncertainty in this precision, what, what, what would be the meaning of a high precision and higher precision? Or I'm just wondering what, what's really the, the meaning of the uncertainty on the precision. Okay, you, you gave the idea, which is true, but um, it's probably true that you couldn't have a very high precision with a very large error bar. Yes. That doesn't make sense, but it's then, not happening there. Yeah, right? it's not happening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And the other way, right? It's very small precision, and then you have a very, very good small error bar in your very bad precision. Oh, it could be very that, strange. <laughs> but that, that would mean that you have some sort of a randomness that is really random. So you cannot get over this. So it's, let's say there's a very regular random pattern. Yeah. And you cannot predict that, but it's very regular, and you have many instances. Okay, and then you will have a, then you have a small error in the precision, but it will be a low precision. That would be an example. Just <laughs> can you go back to the photo Z distribution that you have? Yeah. Yeah. This one. So each distribution there is is obtained from the best bit photo Z, or is it a stack of PDFs? It's from the peak. Yes. Have you tried stacking the PDF? Oh, it's, it's the peak only. So it's the, sort of the yes. whatever. Yes. But can you stack the whole, all the PDFs so they to make a distribution? Yeah. Do that make sense? So I don't know. Other that side. It's usually people like to do that. There's... So don't throw away information. Um, um, if, if you had to use one of these cases for large scale structure studies, which one would you choose? So, yeah, I think we will. I will go check the high quality, quality quasar classification or you could use stack three maps. Yes. It's unclear. My feeling is that there will be a, if you make a bin, a ratchet bin around 2.2 or so in ratchet, you would have a very high confidence in classification and in photo Z. So there will be a high quality sample. So if you select that yeah. and you have the method that really returns to that, then it's a yeah, kind of a... Right, right in this bin. Yes, right there you see yeah. that their accuracy goes down because of many things. Classification gets better. You see that big drop there, right? So I would think that that's the sweet spot there. But anyway, so... So you wouldn't use all, all the quasars, just those that... Yeah. Wrench it into... No, I just, I would, I would... I would perhaps have a, a specific ratchet bin that is more, uh, has higher quality. So you separate things. So you don't want to mix good things with bad things. You want to separate them as best you can. So that one is a specially good one. My precious. But that's just, you know, that's just all with anybody that has ever done the exercise that it's done myself and others, it's, it's like uh, almost a like given. By the way, this plot that you see there on the top right there, it's uh, because of the binning, you, you can't really see, but when you add narrow bands, actually, it makes things uh, significantly better. If you smooth out the curve, maybe this will be easier to see oh. because, you know, it's uh, it, these are normalized. So the fact that you have the peak which is up there means that sides also, they are squished. So. And, and that one is for everything. Or is it everything, everything that's bright enough to, to get wise data? No, no. The, I also have data here that does not have. 
plus cone. Uh, okay, so when you say broad plus calyx plus wide plus narrow, it doesn't mean that necessarily has wides. Uh, there you go. So the comparison isn't entirely fair. But it's hard to make any kind of a uh, sample then. So you could, you could select just a bright sample and then compare broad galaxy wise narrow against broad galaxy wise just for the bright one that has wise and then see. I think I've done that for the classification, but I didn't do yeah. it. Yeah. Probably would look, look better would give would would give you if more uh highlight the importance of the narrow band yes. if you separate the needs way. True, true. Yeah, I can't remember what, what I, I think I, I checked that for the classification. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can do that again. I was like, we're doing things for the five. Okay, so we need to figure out what to do next time. Oh, there you are. You came back. We already have one person who is not here. Yeah, of course. I was not there. Oh, which is the best thing we do on the At least somebody who isn't here to defend themselves. So we say is the next one? I'm checking right now. I think. Um, Ninth of November, I think. Okay, so one of no, them can uh, be then, yeah. Eight of November, sorry. Eight. Nine is Saturday. We are not be here. Okay. Okay, okay. okay so if I are going to slow five. So we're not going to be here either, no. Still five is in Mexico, so yes, still five is in Mexico. So, okay, good. You You're talking about the lot of this. No, <laughs> I exaggerated this time. This year was too much. Last case structure, or yeah, it will be cosmology, large case structure. I'm not sure actually. Okay, okay. but then pull back. Yeah. So we need two more. Here. There's a PS. A PS. Ah, of course. Who is also not here, so he cannot refuse. Yes, he's from uh, yes. Okay. Yes, he's talking about the uh, early universe cosmology. Bias, yes. Galaxy bias. Galaxy bias, so it's not the early universe. No, no, it's late. Late, galaxy bias. So now we, know, we need to go short scale. We need to go galactic to complement. Yeah, Ah, there was this guy with the Hispanic name into speed. Yes. Yeah. Oh. But can you do it one week before or before? November the first? Uh, yes, yes, we have to ask uh, if it's available the rope. Yes, it's arriving next week. Do we want to do it November? Well, then, then you can do it, right? Okay. The week before we can do it. We just have to ask to local people if they provide their own one. Um, November the first. First. This is also such. Is that holiday? No. November second is holiday, but it's up. It yeah. doesn't change much. You want to do it from first then? So only three weeks from now. Sure. So for the fifth now the fifteenth is, is real holiday. Or we can move it to twenty two. No, that turned right. Too, too late. I mean, you can, but. No, first of all, I'm very nice. I say, first of all. So we need somebody else over here. Moral, more less observation. I mean, either galactic or e even somebody in theory. Take away is that quality. 
but my student could react in that give a remote call. Well, remote is what do you think of? Well, we always have the remote. Remote is um, let's say if we we don't find anything, we have somebody that we are working together with. Who is this person? Andrea Vitorelli is in JPL, mm -hmm. so it will have to be in the afternoon time, but only if there's nothing else. Eric, perhaps he has. Anything could you do about finishing his thesis? Oh, he's there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you want okay, we'll find out. We'll we'll close with somebody. I was he checked immediately the other ability. No I'm looking. Yes. Yes. É, we 